Everyone compares these carriers by size, but the real difference isn't visible from the outside. Two aircraft carriers, both launched in 2017, both designed to dominate the seas. One costs $13 billion, the other £3 billion. Pounds. One can sail for 25 years without refueling. The other runs out of fuel in 10,000 miles. But here's what they don't tell you. The real difference has nothing to do with size, nothing to do with nuclear power, nothing to do with how planes take off. The real difference is hidden three decks below the flight deck in the ship's electrical heart. And it reveals two nations that looked at the future of war and made completely opposite bets. One bet on weapons that don't exist yet. The other bet on reliability over revolution. This is the untold story. July 22, 2017, Norfolk, Virginia, the United States Navy commissions USS Gerald R. Ford CVN-78, the largest warship ever built, 100,000 tons of nuclear steel, $13 billion, a decade in construction. It represents the most ambitious leap in carrier design in 50 years. Five months later, Portsmouth, England, HMS Queen Elizabeth enters service, R08, 65,000 tons, conventionally powered, 3 billion pounds, built in sections across the United Kingdom and and assembled like a puzzle. Two carriers, same year, same mission, project air power across hostile waters. But that's where the similarities end. Because beneath the flight decks, inside the machinery spaces, within the weapons magazines, these ships are built on fundamentally opposite philosophies. One is a revolutionary gamble, the other an evolutionary masterpiece. And the difference will define naval power for the next 50 years. Let's talk about something no one mentions. Electricity, not nuclear reactors, not propulsion, electrical generation, USS Gerald R. Ford produces 700 megawatts of electricity, three times more than any Nimitz-class carrier before it, enough to power a city of 100,000 people. HMS Queen Elizabeth, powered by Rolls-Royce MT-30 gas turbines in an integrated electric propulsion system. Efficient, proven, reliable, but nowhere near 700 megawatts. So why does the Ford need all that power? Here's what they don't tell you. The Ford isn't just a carrier. It's an all-electric warship. Everything runs on electricity. The catapults, the elevators, the radars, the defensive systems, everything. Traditional carriers like the Nimitz used steam catapults, massive boilers generating steam under pressure, miles of pipes threading through the ship, heat exchangers, regulators, maintenance teams working around the clock, and it's 95% inefficient. 95% of the energy becomes waste heat. The Ford eliminated all of it. Instead, it uses EMALS, Electromagnetic Aircraft Launch System, energy stored in giant flywheels, released in controlled bursts through linear motors, no steam, no waste, pure electrical power. This freed up massive internal space. Space that now holds weapons, ammunition, future systems. But here's the part that changes everything. Those 700 megawatts aren't for today, they're for tomorrow. The U.S. Navy is developing directed energy weapons, lasers that shoot down missiles at the speed of light, railguns that fire projectiles at Mach 7, electromagnetic pulse systems. These weapons need 20 megawatts, 30, 50. Only a ship with massive electrical reserves can host them. HMS Queen Elizabeth, with conventional gas turbines, cannot. It was built for the weapons of today. USS Gerald R. Ford was built for the weapons of 2045. This isn't an upgrade. This is a different species of warship. Now let's talk about what everyone sees. The launch systems. Ford uses electromagnetic catapults. Queen Elizabeth uses a ski jump ramp. Most people think it's just about how the plane leaves the deck. It's so much more than that. EMALS isn't just a catapult. It's a programmable launch system. Every aircraft is different. A 70-ton FA-18 Super Hornet. A 5-ton reconnaissance drone. A 40-ton early warning plane. Each needs a different acceleration profile. Steam catapults can't adjust. They're mechanical, fixed power. Every launch is the same brutal shock, stressing airframes, causing metal fatigue. EMALS tailors the launch for every single aircraft. Smooth acceleration, less stress, longer airframe life, faster recharge between launches. And here's the kicker. It's software control. When new aircraft are designed, autonomous drones, next-gen fighters, the Ford can launch them. Just update the software. The Queen Elizabeth's ski jump is welded steel. Fixed. Permanent. It can only launch aircraft designed for vertical landing. And that brings us to the aircraft. Ford operates the F-35C. Carrier variant. Eight tons of internal weapons. Full mission range. Can land with weapons still aboard if a mission is scrubbed. Queen Elizabeth Elizabeth operates the F-35B, Stowe VL variant, 6.8 tons of weapons, 17% less payload. When it lands vertically, 43,000 pounds of engine thrust hammers the deck. If it needs to land with weapons, severe penalties. But the real difference? The aircraft Queen Elizabeth cannot operate. E-2D Hawkeye, the airborne radar plane, the all-seeing eye, the brain of the carrier strike group, EA-18G Growler, electronic warfare, jamming enemy radars, blinding missiles, aerial refueling tankers that extend the combat 
combat radius of the entire air wing. Ford can launch all of them. Queen Elizabeth cannot. It relies on Merlin helicopters for early warning. Limited altitude, limited range, limited endurance. This isn't a capability gap. This is a strategic ceiling the Queen Elizabeth can never break through. So why did Britain choose this? Because they tried to do it the American way. In 2010, the UK announced plans to build Queen Elizabeth with catapults. Catabar, just like Ford. They even signed contracts with General Atomics for emails technology. But in 2012, the numbers came back. Costs had doubled. Delivery pushed to 2020. The budget couldn't handle it, so they made the hard call. Revert to STOVL, Ski Jump, F-35B. Get two carriers into service faster. Accept lower capability in exchange for lower risk. It was the right decision. For Britain. But it locked them into a design they cannot escape. Now here's a story that almost killed the Ford. Advanced weapons elevators. 11 electromagnetic elevators designed to move munitions from deep magazines to the flight deck. Faster than hydraulic systems. More efficient. Revolutionary. On paper. In reality, a disaster. The Navy thought thought they could design one elevator and copy it 11 times. But every location in the ship is different. Different structures, different loads, different cable paths. Each elevator needed custom engineering, custom software, custom everything. When the first designs failed, the entire program collapsed. Redesigns, delays, cost overruns. And here's why it mattered. Without working elevators, the Ford couldn't achieve its promised sortie rate. 270 aircraft missions per day, 25% more than a Nimitz. But if weapons can't reach the flight deck, aircraft can't fly. The most advanced advanced carrier in the world couldn't move its ammunition. It took until December 2021, four years after commissioning, for all 11 elevators to be certified. HMS Queen Elizabeth, proven mechanical elevators, British engineering, simple, reliable, boring, no revolution, no failure. While Ford struggled with elevators, Queen Elizabeth was already deploying to the South China Sea. This is the cost of being first. Ford gambled on 23 new technologies at once. Some worked brilliantly, some nearly broke the ship. But here's where Ford's vision starts paying off. Crew size. A Nimitz class carrier needs 3,300 sailors. Ford needs 2,600. 700 fewer. How? Automation. Emails needs fewer technicians. No boiler crews. No steam specialists. Computer-controlled systems replace hydraulic teams. Over 50 years, the Navy calculates Ford will save $4 billion in personnel costs. The most expensive ship becomes the cheapest to operate. HMS Queen Elizabeth takes a different approach. 679 crew for the ship alone. 1,500 when the air wing embarks. Astonishingly efficient for a 65,000-ton carrier, but achieved through evolutionary design, not revolutionary automation. Two paths, same goal, different philosophies. Now here's what changes everything. HMS Queen Elizabeth was designed with a secret, a fail-safe, a hedge against the future. Even though it operates Ski Jump and Stoviel today, the ship was built with future Catabar conversion in mind. The deck dimensions, the structural reinforcements, the placement of equipment spaces, all designed so that, if needed, catapults and arresting gear could be installed. British engineers left the door open. If budgets allow, if threats evolve, Queen Elizabeth could transform its adaptation within known boundaries. USS Gerald R. Ford was designed for a different future entirely, not to be upgraded with proven systems, but to host weapons that don't exist yet. When directed energy lasers mature, when railguns become operational, when electromagnetic weapons need 50 megawatts of power, Ford's electrical grid is ready. Plug and play. The ship doesn't need redesign. It just needs the weapon. And here's the strategic twist nobody talks about. Queen Elizabeth's conventional propulsion is seen as a weakness limited range, needs refueling. But there's a hidden advantage. Nuclear carriers can sail forever. The Ford can operate 25 years without refueling. Total independence. But the air wing still needs jet fuel. The crew needs food. The magazines need bombs. Even nuclear carriers depend on logistics. Queen Elizabeth's conventional power forces it into coalition logistics networks, allied ports, resupply partnerships, integrated operations. In modern warfare, where alliances matter more than lone wolf operations, this isn't a flaw. It's a feature. Ford projects independent American power. Queen Elizabeth projects coalition strength. Two visions of naval dominance. Neither wrong. So what's the real difference between USS Gerald R. Ford and HMS Queen Elizabeth? It's not the catapults, not the reactors, not the size. It's a choice. The USS Gerald R. Ford is a $13 billion declaration that future wars will be fought with electromagnetic weapons, autonomous systems, and technologies we haven't invented yet. It's a warship built for a future that doesn't exist. HMS Queen Elizabeth is a $3 billion-pound statement that future wars will be won with proven systems, reliable operations, and coalition partnerships. It's a warship built for the world as it is. One says, leap into the unknown, accept the risk, transform warfare. The other says, master the present, build on what works, advance with certainty in, and here's the truth they won't tell you. We don't know which vision is right, not yet. If directed energy weapons become standard, if electromagnetic catapults dominate carrier aviation, 
If autonomous drones require massive electrical grids, then Ford's 700 megawatts will look like genius. If coalition operations define the next 50 years, if sustained reliability matters more than revolutionary tech, if partnerships win wars, then Queen Elizabeth's pragmatism will be vindicated.